everyone. I'm Francine Lacroix from Bloomberg TV, and I could not be more delighted to talk about sort of what we can do to make climate change at the forefront of all of our sustainability efforts. Now, with this panel is in 25 minutes, for 25 minutes, and we talk about the solutions for change to try and find some of the meaningful solutions that will really make a difference. So not just talking the talk, but actually putting the talk into actions. And I am very delighted to be joined now by Jim Andrew, Chief Sustainability Officer at PepsiCo, Rebecca Marmot, Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever, and uh, Puneet Ranjan, Global Chief Executive Officer at Deloitte. So thank you for joining us. It's gonna be an interesting and robust conversation. Puneet, everything that underpins, of course, what we've been trying to do post Glasgow, what some of the company pledges we've seen across sectors and across regions, is really that there is a lot of people wanting to do better but now we need to look at the actions. And you have this wonderful report called, you know, the CXO Sustainability Report. So first of all, CXO is basically any C-suite. Are you optimistic about the future or is there much more to be done? Thank you for having us. I'm very optimistic about the future. There is a lot that needs to be done. There are some interesting aspects in that report. Uh, first, 80% of respondents, CXOs, believe that we are at a tipping point. Another 80% are, have been personally impacted uh, by climate. And to me, I think that is an optimistic sign uh, in terms of uh, climate is here. Uh, 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 climate is here is a big issue and that uh, we as, a, uh, as a, a business community are ready to embrace it. What do you mean by tipping point? So are, are you know, C-suite saying, look, we can do more? Or are they actually doing more? Are you disappointed by the pace of change? Well, I think a tipping point in this, uh, from a standpoint that customers are demanding it, employees are expecting it, uh, and there is a disconnect between aspirations and actual uh, outcomes, and that needs to be addressed. I'll give you one quick uh, uh, anecdote vis-a-vis uh, -vis Deloitte, 86% of the 350,000 professionals that call Deloitte home are Gen Zs and millennials. Their number one issue is climate. If I want to be able to retain the best, hire the best, I must have a credible response vis-a-vis -vis climate. And so I think um, that uh, uh, to me is, a, uh, is, is really the, uh, the, the issue why uh, I believe uh, it's at a tipping point. Um, Jim, talk to me a little bit about PepsiCo. So how much, I don't know whether we want to talk in percentage form, but actually how much efforts do you think PepsiCo has done so far and how much more can you do in the next two to three years to become more sustainable, either through recycling or packaging and all of that circle? Uh, well, I think that it's that's exactly the, the right question, which is how much and, and how much more. And at PepsiCo, you know, we've, we've been active in sustainability for a decade, but as some of the uh, items that were mentioned in the report, you know, things have continued to accelerate. And, and over the last two or three years, we've taken huge steps. Uh, last year, we announced PepsiCo Positive, which is really our overarching strategic transformation of how we're going to change the entire company, how we grow and how we create value by really helping to create a more sustainable food system and make changes for the planet and, and people, but importantly also for our business. So we've made a lot of changes, but I think the next couple of years, whether it's climate or packaging or water, you know, all those areas that are important to our business are gonna be places where we're gonna be continuing to make real progress. And we've announced very clear goals and you know, we have very clear plans to go after those really important areas for our business. Rebecca, where do you identify, you know, a disconnect maybe on what Unilever wants to do, but also the difficulties in achieving it? Well, and firstly, Penny, congratulations on the report, because I think you've exactly hit the nail on the head. It's all about now taking all the commitments, and it's, it's brilliant to see over the past few years that lots and lots of companies are setting that zero target and setting up very ambitious plans around what they want to do on climate. But actually, it's now about putting it into action. So We've tried very hard to do that. We launched last year at our AGM a climate transition action plan, which really set out exactly what we want to do and when we want to do it by. And I think crucial as well, it's not just around short-term targets, it's around, sorry, long-term targets, it's also around short-term targets. So we set ourselves interim dates at a three-year basis 
to update on where we are on net zero, what we're doing in our operations, what we're doing across the value chain, the brands, the products, and how we can bring that to life through wider society. So, Jim, you've identified you know, a couple of areas where, of course, you have set targets and say, you know, we'll work on this to make it better. What's hardest in those areas? Is it the packaging? Is it the plastic? Is it the supply chain? And is it only by saying what's you know, tough and difficult that you think shareholders will maybe believe you more and, and you, know, you need that extra push to really get things done? The, the... We, 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 we've set goals that actually in all the areas that are important to us, I would, I would say are quite aggressive and, and therefore challenging. But to, to Rebecca's point, if you don't set bold long-term goals, um, you're never gonna make the progress you need in the short term. And while that may sound counterintuitive, you know, I, th I think that <clears throat> it, it actually fits very nicely. We've got to be making progress every year. And so we've got, by year plans across all of our goals so that by 2030 and for climate net zero by 2040, we've really landed in a key set of areas that are important to our business, real meaningful progress. You know, which is hardest is to say, I think they're all challenging, um, but that's what's, you know, is necessary for the planet and for people and why we've really wrapped them all together as part of a holistic plan to transform what we do. In, ter in terms of you know, how we communicate that, I think it's really about transparency and it's about consistency. You know, we, we every year report where we are against each of our goals. And along the way, if we can, we give interim updates. So it's that transparency and that rigorous methodologies and measurements that's gonna really help build trust, but also help build momentum and progress. You know, Francine, if I... Yeah. If I may, just real quickly, I want to highlight a couple of points that Jim and Rebecca made. First, uh, I think this is a, we certainly have to sell, set long-term targets, but we have to demonstrate that we're making progress here and now. And I think that is really important. Jim made a point around transparency, and I think that's really important as well. Being completely honest and transparent in terms of the progress being made against science-based targets and consistency in terms of measurement is important, uh, both from a regulatory standpoint, but also from a, a company comparability standpoint. And I think that those are all areas that we need to, uh, uh, need to uh, work on. But Puna, and this is, is highlighted in your report, right? That there's a, a clear disconnect between executives being very ambitious, wanting to do targets, and then the actual impact. So how do you make sure that progress is really made. At the moment, we're still talking about frameworks, about definitions, about how we can compare. Like what will actually make a difference that can save our planet? Well, I think there is, uh, for it's, it's easier, I would say, for a private enterprise, even though a large private enterprise like Deloitte, uh, because I can take a longer term view, uh, but there is a disconnect because of the short term orientation in terms of what public companies are under uh, versus the long term and the action required. I think that's one key aspect. I think there is now a demonstration, maybe not a clear causal link, that entities, companies that are focused on climate, it is not only the right thing to do, it is the right business thing to do. I gave you the example of Deloitte. If 86% of my professionals rank climate and ESG issues as their top priority, as the leader of this organization, I must have a credible response if I want to be able to retain them and to hire them. And so it does make good business sense. And uh, I think demonstrating that and putting that into the narrative will enable companies to, to make the investments, the short-term investments, uh, and see the payoff that will take longer than the short term. You know, the problem, Rebecca, I remember actually speaking to a, a big chief executive who sold shampoos and he told me people want to, you know, buy things that are better for the environment. But then if it's a choice between that shampoo that's better for the environment or have glossy hair, they'll always go for the glossy hair. So where do you see the pressure coming from? Is it shareholders? Is it civil society? And how much does Glasgow and COP26 help? I, mean, I think it's, I think, I mean, I think it's, sorry, ahead, Rebecca, Rebecca first, and then I'll come to Pune. Yeah, I think it. I think it's all of those. When you look at, you know, the Deloitte report that came out this morning, you look at things like the Edelman Trust Barometer. You know, it is widespread that 
that multi-stakeholder model. So it's shareholders and it's consumers and it's employees that we heard from Meet talking about before. You know, 78% of people agree businesses should adopt science-based targets and they believe businesses should put climate change experts into leadership positions. Crucially to your point, 64% of people in that Edelman Trust Barometer survey said they boycott a brand based on their beliefs about climate change. So I think the challenge, but also the opportunity for, for companies like Unilever and Pepsi, it's great to have Jim on the, on the call, is making sure that you're producing really high quality products, but at the same time, you know, affordable products accessible to everybody, but actually they're offering the level of performance that people want from their products and they're able to protect the planet. You know, when, when we look at the, the, the taking action part that Panit's been talking about this morning, we've really tried to concentrate on our portfolio over this past couple of years and moving forward and say, how do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, so for example, across our home care portfolio, we've launched something called Clean the Future. So we're eliminating all of the fossil fuel derived carbon out of our cleaning and laundry products and putting in instead different options. So blue carbon, purple carbon. So we can do things like, for example, last year, we launched a laundry capsule, which was made out of captured and, and recycled industrial carbon emissions mm -hmm. in China. So I think it's using that kind of tech to come up with product opportunities, which are really enticing to people. You know, things like SIF AP refill, instead of buying a new yeah. spray every time you want to clean your surfaces, you know, cleaning around the kitchen, you just buy a little um, little top-up bottle and you put it into the original spray you that you've got. So we're saving masses of plastic being being able to do that. I know, I mean, I, that's, I guess, just scratching the surface, right? Because there's so much more that we can do. I have a great audience question for both Jim and Rebecca. Jim, I don't, you can start us off. Do you purchase carbon offsets to actually accomplish your overall sustainability goals? Uh, we do not. We are uh, committed to reducing our carbon footprint. And uh, so our goals for 2030, which are 40% of our scope one and two, so the things we directly control, and 75%, I'm sorry, 75% for scope one and two, the things we directly control, and 40% for scope three, which is all the rest of our value chain, those targets we will hit without using offsets. Um, so, because we believe it's really important to reduce, reduce, reduce. And uh, that aligns very well with the science-based targets uh, where our targets are, are science-based and have been certified. So uh, we don't, we use insets um, to offset, for example, our, our the full emissions impact of our business air travel, but those are projects directly in our supply chain. So short answer to your question, no, we're, we are not using offsets to reach our goals until the very end, which everybody would acknowledge is necessary. 2030 goals, 100% around reductions. Uh, Rebecca, um, to you, to this great audience question. Yeah, so, 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 so very similar, exactly the same. We're focusing on absolute emissions reductions. So I think one of the risks with offsetting is it actually distracts from, from reducing emissions and tangible action that you can take straight away as a priority. So for us, it's all about reducing emissions in, in, in the short term. And I think actually the, the five stages Panit, that you set out in your report this morning around looking at tangible things that all businesses can do to try and make a difference it, for, for us is, is, is where we feel we have to start. So it's how do you bring it to life through your products? How do you work right the way across your value chain? So, for example, we're working now with our upstream suppliers to reduce carbon emissions with, with up for about 60% uh, uh, carbon emissions with our top 300 suppliers. We're doing the same thing with our retail partners. We're thinking about how we do our sourcing. So we've just launched, for example, a renewable agriculture code uh, with Canor, looking at how can we farm in a more efficient way. So making sure that we're reducing the carbon in the, our own operations, we're reducing it across our supply chain. We're working, for example, on things like water stewardship across all our manufacturing yeah. sites. So really, I think looking at those different touch points across your value chain yeah. and making sure you've come up with a plan for each different segment. Rebecca, what's the one thing you wish you, you were doing better? Um, I think we've made, I think we've made really good progress. I think the absolute key for us, and we've learned this over, you know, the past 10 years on, on the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which ran from 2010 to 2020, is there's a lot that we can do as a business through communications campaigns and through the work that we're doing with our brands to encourage consumers to make small differences in their lifestyle. So for example, if you're using a washing machine, you turn to 30, you wash it at a short wash cycle. 
But I think what we really discovered is the optimal thing that we can do is help to drive change in wider society. And actually to do that, we have a massive role to play as Unilever, but it's about working with others as well. So how do you get, for example, lots of companies to sign up to the to the climate pledge that was launched around COP26. Mm. How do you get participation in really big cross-sector collaborations, RE100, yeah. cargo owners for zero emission vessels, et cetera. So I think it's about pushing the whole of society forward and taking these kind of approaches. And, and Puneet, I mean, you've called that out a number of times in the report. So Puneet, when you look at, of course, some of the work that you've done in the survey, what are the main obstacles that you see holding back you know, chief executives or C-suite in general to try and achieve some of these you know, life-changing goals? Well, I mean, you know, 97% of the companies or the executives that we surveyed, 2,000 of them, uh, have climate as a key agenda item. So I think the, the acknowledgement that we have to address the issue is the first step. Most have uh, a, a strategy in terms of how they're going to get there. I think the real disconnect is between the pace, uh, 2040, 2050, I think is appropriate, but I think we need to front load it. Uh, the second is around execution. It's a, it requires relentless execution and it requires an organizational change from a mindset standpoint, but also in terms of how we are implementing it. Then Jim and Rebecca has men have mentioned this. We have to, in a transparent way, publish the progress that we are making, build the trust in uh, the progress that we are making, but also acknowledge that this is not easy. It is, uh, it, it will require work. Uh, certainly at Deloitte, we acknowledge that. We've made a commitment that we'll be net zero by 2030, um, and uh, it will require significant work and a significant change in the way that we operate, in the way that we travel. Uh, travel is a big component of our um, uh, carbon footprint. It reduced 41%. We were aided to some extent by the pandemic. Now maintaining that level of reduction is going to take work. And so mm -hmm. it is hard work. I have a couple of great questions actually on materials used for, for packaging, but maybe Jim, a uh, simple, but also a hard question on Glasgow. I don't know whether COP26 was a catalyst for good, or whether there's a danger that a lot of companies and a lot of industries did a lot, a lot of effort in the lead up to COP26 and then kind of now are resting on their laurels. I don't know many companies that are resting on their laurels. Um, I think the lead up work was great. And I think there's a whole lot more to do. You know, on, only 17% of the Fortune 500, according to uh, WWF, only 17% have science-based targets for climate. So there's still a huge, huge uh, opportunity for the other 83%. I think, you know, if I were to just highlight two areas uh, for real progress after Glasgow, one is, you know, collaboration and partnership. And, you know, we, we, we work with, I'll work with almost anybody uh, who shares the goals that I have. You know, we work a lot with Unilever. We've got some great collaborations there, but, but I think it's going to take all of us. And so collaboration and partnership, and I think that's a real benefit coming out of Glasgow. I think we've seen a lot more of that. Uh, you know, we, we, I spoke there around a partnership that we've got with Mars, McCormick, and Guidehouse, and you know, with our suppliers. There's a whole lot of others. So I think collaboration and partnership is one real lever. And the other we've talked about is how do we continue to shine a bright light, build trust around transparency and consistency of measurement, and really making that progress uh, that uh, Deloitte talks about in the report. You know, so I think I'm, I'm optimistic coming out of Glasgow and there's still a lot of work to do and we all need to really put our shoulder against it. But it's, it's the right thing for the planet. It's also the right thing for business. And I think that's the really powerful thing that came out of Glasgow's. People saw that. Rebecca, do you agree that, you know, and collaboration is always a good thing, but actually do we need to be more aggressive with targets? I don't know whether it's linking compensation, whether, you know, how do you put sustainability really at, at at the center of every business decision in the company. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree, Jim, with you. I think COP progress was made. Of course, there was always more that we could do, but we decided actually this year, or last year, I should say, uh, end of, of 2021, we went to COP as, as, as a partner. So not just the work that we're doing at a corporate level, but we also went along with our brands to try and really engage day-to-day -day consumers around the changes that they could make. And we all saw what came out of COP. There were some good targets and there were some good resolutions. But I think now it's really, I guess, a couple of areas. 
One is really looking at what we can do. You know, we're, we're big global companies, but what can we do at a country level to work with governments to make sure that at a, a country level, country governments are setting that zero target. I think there's things that we can do, you know, letters to trade organizations, business groups. We want to make sure that the current lobbying positions that that, that our industry groups are taking on climate policy are consistent with, with our own position around the 1.5 degree ambition set out in Paris uh, and making sure that other organizations we're working with are setting science-based targets. I think the point about linking it to, to performance is absolutely critical. So we have had now for the past eight years, 10 years, 25% of the performance plan for manager level and above, so that's about 14,000 people across Unilever, is linked to what we call our SPI, it's our, our Sustainability Progress Index. So we take one target from each of the eight pillars of what we call our compass, our, our integrated business and sustainability plan, and then we measure how far we're progressing against those targets, and then that leads to 25% to, to of the performance plan for managers. And I think you know, that really, really helps to focus. And I think also to your point, right. you know, it isn't about me and my team delivering this. This is about working across supply chain. It's about R&D, thinking about innovation. It's about marketing and really making sure that it is spread right the way across the business. I think I have, seen one thing that COP yeah, uh, uh, focused on was governments. And I think business has to play a very, very big critical role. In fact, maybe the most important role. And you know, we've talked about uh, scope one and two uh, uh, commitments and scope three commitments. Deloitte has taken it one step further. We have 350,000 professionals, as I said. We have launched a training program with the World uh, Wildlife Fund, uh, uh, Fund to train all 350,000 professionals around climate as to how they can, through their individual actions and through their communities, uh, make a difference. I think that for all our companies, we employ a lot of people. I think that's an action that uh, we can all collectively take. And this is a great question from the audience member, which kind of feeds to what you were just saying. Are you putting pressure on government decision makers to accelerate right, some of the commitments to carbon negative or climate positive action? Put it. Well, the answer is yes. Uh, we are absolutely engaging with public policymakers. Uh, Jim and Rebecca talked about common uh, measurement. Uh, that is one area we need to have consistent measurement uh, that is akin to financial uh, uh, measurement. Uh, and that's one area that we are actively working on. We worked with 150 other companies uh, to come up with one set of measures on people, planet, prosperity, and principles of governance using the metrics that exist today. And so getting to common metrics, I think, is an important step in, uh, in uh, related to the question that you just asked. And Jim and Rebecca, we only have two minutes, so one minute each you know, on the flip side of that. What do your companies and your sector need from governments to actually achieve your goals faster, Jim? Uh, we need policies that support the transition. So whether it's in, in packaging, you know, smart, we, we actively support well-designed extended producer responsibility programs, whether it is uh, incentives for regenerative agriculture, you know, we've, we've got a 7 million acre uh, agricultural footprint. So programs that support regenerative agriculture, um, you know, carbon emissions actions, there's a whole set of, we need policies that support companies and the rest of society as we make those transitions. And again, it really, Francine, it gets back to collaboration. All of us have to work together to be able to make this transformation move forward. We're, we're committed to doing that and, and working with governments and others to really move the right policies forward to help us all speed on that transition. Rebecca, what do you need from governments? What does your yeah, business I, need from I, 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 I agree, Jim. I mean, I think there's, you know, there is, we haven't got time to talk about it now, but you know, calling on governments to adopt global carbon pricing mechanism, I think that's really, really important. I think making sure that there is a framework in place, we, we for example, um, hugely supportive of, of, of TCFD, and making sure that you are really pushing governments to have that kind of measurement framework in place, really looking at where investments are being made. Punit, what about you know what about you? I'm sure you're speaking also to world leaders. How can they support the global effort? Sometimes it feels like it's businesses that have been really filling that vacuum where governments were nowhere to be seen. How can you reverse that so that private and public work together? 
this is the challenge of our generation. And Jim and Rebecca have said it eloquently. We all need to work together. Uh, governments, uh, business, uh, civil society, and as individuals. It seems uh, overwhelming if you look at it uh, by individual uh, entity, uh, but working together, we can, we can lick this.